lecturer tonight, Phoebe Cutler, who is a, uh, at, I'm going to use her own words, a landscape designer, uh, an author, a world traveler at this point, and uh, uh, she comes to us as part of a uh, tour she's of sorts. She's speaking in the Midwest. She's speaking down in Indianapolis tomorrow. She'll be over at the University of Illinois shortly. Uh, she's uh, how are you primar primarily known? She is primarily known as a historian, and uh, her book, uh, one of the ones that she has published, is called The Public Landscape of the New Deal. She's also working on a book on Italian gardens. Uh, she's published in Landscape Architecture Magazine, please, in the United States. Uh, she's published in Landscape Architecture Magazine, Landscape, Horticulture, Garden Design, and a number of others. She has her Bachelor of Arts from Harvard and a Master's in Landscape Architecture from Berkeley. And without further ado, I will end in this form. And I don't want to have to hold it and do all this other stuff. <laughs> all right. Next. Um, if you can't hear me, will you raise your hands, please? Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I'll talk. I'll talk loud. Uh, the formal garden in the Western world is Italian. During the Renaissance and Baroque periods of the late 15th century, do you hear me? Okay. Of the late 15th century through the 16th century, Italy created so many masterful gardens that in subsequent periods, when an architect has wanted to do a formal garden, he or she has almost invariably had to copy Italy, even if they did not know they were doing so, or even if they did not want to particularly. Each century since, since the 16th century, except the eight, um, it made one exception of the 18th when the British natural style dominated the, cent the tradition of Central Park that Central Park is in, um, has had a different supreme country that has adopted and made the Italian garden its chief form of expression. The 17th century was the century of France, and you know, all know Versailles and its um, chief architect, the Note. Um, it can be said that some will argue that England is, was the dominant country to exercise the Italian garden heritage in the 19th century at its height of its empire during the Victorian period. An example of this is that the architect who designed the House of Parliament was also very active in the late, in the 1840s, 1850s, in designing Italianate gardens, Sir Patrick Barry. Also, Edward Lutyens, and some will argue with, a lot, lot, many will argue with me, but Gertrude Jekyll was working in the Italianate, within, within an Italianate framework also. And English, the English, um, English force, or the English, uh, monopoly of the Italianate garden lapped over into the 20th century, but principally the dominant power uh, practicing in the Italian style in the 20th century has been this country. And the period that it was has been most prolific with Italianate gardens is 1890 to 1940. Um, the, there was an eclipse when the uh, Italian garden kind of went underground, um, suffered in the modernist, during the modernist period, but even then, um, modernist landscape architects who are considered modernists like uh, Tommy Church and um, uh, Clark and Ralph, uh, Gilmore Clark, the designer of many of the, um, the Bronx River Parkway and the Park West and Parks around New York, the UN, setting for the UN, was trained in a um, classic Italianate fashion, and as certainly was his partner, Michael Rapuano, Rapuano, who studied in Rome for two or three years as a fellow at the American Academy. Um, it's not hard for me to um, be convinced that Muncie 
did not escape the dominance of the Italian Garden in the United, um, in the United States between 1890 and 1940, because almost the first thing I saw when I got out of my car was the civic memorial to the Ball Brothers, which is, I must say is a fabulous example of early Italian aid. Although it's late, it's in the early Italian aid style of around 1880 to 1900, because the architect, who does, sculptor who designed the as, as, as from what um, Bob Benson told me, that Daniel Chester French's last um, public monument. Well, French, as you probably know, did the statue, best known for the statue of Lincoln in the uh, Lincoln Memorial in Washington, and was a, a very um, celebrated sculptor of the late 19th century. And when he did this, if, if Bob is correct, which I'm sure he is, being a renowned professor here, that uh, he was in his 90s. Well, a man in his 90s is not going to suddenly say, "Well, even though it's 1920, I should be, um, I should be really working in a slightly more streamlined fashion." And he really ha probably will have not been reading the latest House and Garden, so <laughs> probably couldn't see it. But um, so you, <laughs> so instead of a kind of 20s-looking flapper, which is what you get in a 20s Italianate garden get somebody who looks like Mrs. John Jacob Astor holding up her uh, chest representing, I guess, all the riches of the, the Ball family. <laughs> and uh, then you have that very Roman, uh, Roman looking, very, not even Renaissance, but Roman, and, and I'll show you that's a characteristic of the, of the early Italianate garden in this country, of that ensemble of the colonnades. And I should begin right now. Uh, with the slides, please. The, do I have to know? There are three, Ita three Italian gardens of the late, the, um, three Italian gardens of the late Renaissance that were the most, have been the most influential on the American um, version. And these three are the Villa Farnese and Caparola. I'm going to have to take a while to get used to this. It's, it's, if I want the slides to start, do I have to do anything? Okay. Uh, this lecture is called Caparola in America, but it's, it could, I can argue that this is um, the most influential of all the Italian gardens on um, what went on in this country between 1890 and 1940. And this, and the next one, wait a minute, no, I'm not gonna change yet. This, well, this, the Villa Lante and the, um, the Villa d'Este are all in the hills of Rome. They're all pretty much late 16th century. And, uh, there, this is, this has easily um, influenced more gardens than any other because, not because Americans visited, but because of the great imagery that was published and mass produced about it. But to point out some of the aspects of an Italian Renaissance garden that are important and that were transcribed here, let's see, so many tools. Uh, uh, well, very important, most important probably, or the two most important aspects are, is this long axis, this long vertical axis that was a very um, pretty powerful, consistent characteristic. And uh, then this water feature also was much uh, imitated, but this concept of balance, having the same elements on both sides, also, these minor horizontal axes, and then the use of water. Uh, although that's not, the French made of Italian garden tradition made the water a very dominant, a very important feature. I would say the American adaptation did not so much, but this is, it's definitely a, a, um, a characteristic. And the use of architectural features, and all these features, of course, all these aspects make it a formal garden. I'm losing this. Wait a minute. Uh, 
I can go to the next one and talk while I'm fixing this, I think. Um, here are two imitations of, yeah, of um, Caparulla. The one on the left is the Oakley Thorn place in Santa Barbara. I may tie this up. <laughs> and it may never get this off me. Uh, that's o the Oakley Thorn place in Santa Barbara, and the one on the right is San Simeon, which many of you may have met, gone to. It's one of the few state parks in the country, the whole nation, that makes money because so many people do go see it. But, uh, no, I'm just I'm getting it secure, I hope. Uh, the water feature um, of the uh, Oakley Thorn Garden, now recently bought by a Washington lawyer and under renovation until there was no water to be had anywhere in Santa Barbara. And uh, here, more, the, this is more of a landscape architect's garden. Mrs. Thorne was a very um, capable and celebrated landscape architect. I mean, no, just designer in her own right, and a gardener. And this is Julia Morgan's, of course, greatest or most elaborate work. Julia Morgan being the first wo woman, woman of any nationality to graduate from the Beaux-Arts in Paris, a native of Oakland, California. Uh, here you see what has been imitated is, she's not so much interested in the landscape, her training is not landscape, but she is very uh, influenced by this palazzo, the palazzo that you saw there. And uh, this is now, incidentally, the summer place for the Italian president in, uh, well, in Italy. <laughs> and uh, it has, is, is undergoing renovation, and they're doing a pretty good job of it. Okay. The, ne the next garden is actually more celebrated than the uh, Villa d'Este. I mean, it's more celebrated than Cap... Oh, something happened along here. Let's go back. This is more celebrated than the uh, Caparola, more, more well known, because it is, for one thing, it's been open to the public and much more accessible. And it's also the, the sheer... Uh, exuberant spectacle that cannot be surpassed of, of Italian gardens. But when all the water systems are working, it's a, a real Disney operation. And uh, it is, uh, of course, in Tivoli, to the west of Rome. And my feeling about the Villa d'Este is everyone will know it, everyone will have heard about it. But very few people have copied it. It's like trying to copy Disneyland without having the Disney Corporation behind you. It's pretty inimitable. Um, but I feel that its influence is very strong. The influence is more just um, ind an indirect one. So that this whole this notion, this very strong notion that pervaded so much of American uh, landscape design of the first part of the century of the long vertical alley comes is very strong in uh, at the Villa d'Este and is picked up in places like uh, this is the Johns Hopkins place a state outside of uh, Baltimore and uh, called Tear Canal actually uh, an English name after an English estate and it's very conceivable that the immediate inspiration for this was an English, um, was a British garden, but ultimately the inspiration is the Villa d'Este or Villa Lante or any of these, uh, Caparola, any of these Italianate gardens. You have to bear with me a little bit. That's, again, um, 
the Johns Hopkins garden, which remained in the same family until a couple of years ago, which is always, um, if any garden has survived intact to this era, and this garden dates back from 1916, if it's in good condition, it usually means very few families have owned it. Uh, does anyone know this? This is in um, Columbus, Indiana. It's the Irwin Garden, and it's a good example of the early or turn of the century period, the initial introduction in this century of the Italian garden to this country, because it's for several reasons. One is that the Italian garden was very often the home of the local industrial elite. In this case, um, the Miller Irwin family that developed in basically developed into the, the business that became Cummins Engine. Uh, another feature that marks it as an early garden is this structure here, which not, doesn't show up very well, but it's a copy of the Villa, portico of the Villa Medici in Rome. It was much used at the turn of the century by the Kim Mead and White. The um, Morgan Library in New York has this design, and the Kim Mead, that's an 1890, 1880-something building. Anyways, late 19th century. Kim Mead and White used it on, in Bowdoin College in Maine. This garden is, ninth, is 19, let's see, 1910 by an architect named Henry Phillips from Milton, Massachusetts. Another uh, feature that marks it as early is, is the fact that it is an architect's garden, not a landscape architect's garden. The landscape profession was still very young. Architects were doing a lot of this early work. Again, it's a, um, which you don't see here, but there are many Roman elements, uh, antique, ancient Roman, based on uh, Rome from the 4th century BC, uh, 100 BC to 400 AD that marked much of the early work. The Renaissance was not necessarily the direct inspiration for these early gardens, just as your um, civic memorial. Daniel Chester French was not thinking in terms of Renaissance gardens. He was more in, in terms of the forum, the aqueducts, the whole architectural legacy of the Roman Empire. But you see that the, the water chain is here as a kind of entry Renaissance feature. Uh, this is compared to Caparolo or the uh, Villa uh, d'Este, a rather a um, crude translation. The um, no longer limestone, no longer much sculptural detail, kind of a heavy, awkward concrete and translation that matches, I must say, the, the house well. In, in this period that I'm going to be talking about of uh, 30 or 40 years, there was an enormous development of these gardens, and you'll see in a, another, I'm going to show you another water cascade from the 1930s in Oakland, California, and what, ha what happens over 30 years. This is the Woodminster Cascade in the hills around Oakland. This was a WPA project of 1930, approximately 1936. There are several developments that have occurred in the um, 30, 20 years since the Phillips Garden. You still have an architect at work, but now the architect's collaborating with a forester, Edgar Sanborn. The architect was Edward Fulkus. Edward Fulkus. And uh, what has happened is you've got the uh, Native American landscape elements have come in. Redwood trees. I guess you all know what a redwood looks like. I don't need to point it out. Uh, but um, maybe not a buckeye. That's a buckeye, a native California plant. And this 
is um, Sierra Stone brought in, sucked in at 800 miles from this, 800, 300 miles from the Sierras. And this is actually a feature that um, I will mention later, but remember it, it's a fountain that was um, added. This garden is in five tiers. It's a tremendous long vista that looks over the city of Oakland, but uh, this is, and so it starts up there, then there are about two, there's a water pool, and then there's a, this, this fall, and then the, the water runs down through here, and into this pool, which came from the Treasure Island Fair, and had what they're very, very proud of, their electrified fountain. And, uh, but um, this is a slide from 1990, and that's, uh, 1984, and in between time, what is happening to many of the Italianate gardens around this country, this garden has begun to be um, renovated. They've taken out the redwoods, which have really gotten too large. This is which is really a, a post, I mean, a modern, modernistic or um, 1930s kind of fascist rendition of the um, Palazzo at Caparola and very um, kind of Mussolini looking, but very typical of 30s, late 30s, early 40s architecture. It was pretty universal, it wasn't just Mussolini. And, uh, but you see what's happened to all those kind of nice shell-like basins, and um, they've become tr translated into uh, Sierra Stone. More um, going back to another, as a contrast between the early part of the period of Italianate gardens and the later one. Oh no, here's more. I forgot I had more. Um, on your right is the view looking down from the um, portico of that. The other side of that uh, portico is a outdoor theater, again all WPA, but this is looking down the cascade into the Treasure Island Fountain, then there's another pool down below, then there are more steps, and that's the city of Oakland. And here's the first terrace, and looking up one of the steps. and they're going to restore the water in this pool, too, in this cascade. Um, this is another of the early Italianate gardens, um, more in the style of the Ball Memorial. And uh, this is Leonard, um, no, not Leonard, <laughs> the Kunz, Luther Kunz's place in Morristown County, New Jersey. The house behind was built in 1883. The garden was sometime before 1900. But uh, the influence of classic Rome, the imperial Rome, is only too evident in this very um, derivative series of marble statues, probably, in, probably um, brought over from Italy, as many of them were. This is now a uh, combination school and abbey. This was once the estate, the largest estate in Marstown County. It was 4,000 acres, now 30. And they're having a hard time keeping the, this one little remnant. I'm sure, very sure, there was a much more elaborate garden. There probably would have been a um, whole area in here of sunken, sunken area with um, clipped uh, boxwood and flowers or roses. And Father Beatus told me that they should be boxing, wrapping these marble statues with canvas, then hay, and then it wooden boxes every winter because marble is not used in the New Jersey winter. Again, uh, to a contrast to the end of the period, we stick to the 1930s again, and this is Dealey Plaza in Dallas. Nope. <laughs> this is 
ceremonial entrance to Dallas done during the New Deal, again, um, make work or depression labor paid by the federal government and with uh, materials being paid for by the local government. And this is, um, again, the use of pergola, which you see, saw at the Kunstgarten, but stripped down to its bare essentials, merely a suggestion on our left of pergola, and then a row of colonnades with, you don't see it, but obelisks. This is downtown Dallas, and that's the Texas School Book Depository building. So there are a lot of tourists around here, and they're not to see the work of the 1930s. Uh, this is where Kennedy was driving into town when he was shot. Um, two, two more. This is, um, and I have to kind of, again, um, somewhat qualify what I was saying by stating that the Renaissance gardens became, the, rather than the ancient Roman gardens, became the major influence in the late part of this period, because certainly this has a look of ancient Rome rather than a hillside uh, cardinal's house um, villa. This is one of J.B. L.B. Jackson's early creations. The, on the other side of these colonnades were pools built by the National Youth Association, which was the high school version of the New Deal workforce, and L.B.J. was the head of it. But that just shows how far and wide the Italian garden went, even touched L.B.J. Uh, I want to return for a moment to Oops, Mother Whoops, more scenes of the Dealey Plaza. Uh, I think what I wanted to show by this last one, not that one. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> that one. <laughs> now, to go back. Um, by that one is the, if one, the great effectiveness of, a, of the pergola as a, a vehicle for um, expressing light and shadow. And th this is a return on the right to Caparola to just recall to you what the sources of all this are, how detailed and opulent they were, and how far afield the American translations with their very bare uh, a treatment were from these dolphins. This is the dolphin stairway at Caparola with its shell basins and its dolphin, and then this all well, this beautifully inlaid brick on, on edge uh, looking over the um, the caryatid garden. The caryatids are these columns shaped into human figures. Another uh, close-up of Caparola. This is the vase, the fountain of the vase at the top of the water stairs. Again, this tradition, this very rich tradition that uh, America was influenced by but couldn't really hope to and did not try uh, to imitate totally. Um, the... Uh, Italians were probably most aware of what was happening in the United States, even more than the United States. There was a show in 1931, a retrospective history of the Italian garden in Florence, and the introduction to the catalog stated that there had been a return in the Western world to the rational architecture, which had, in, in, as a result, um, created a whole 
uh, reawaken interest in the Italian garden, which was, after all, a very reasoned uh, design. And uh, the catalog mentioned that there were many foreign architects clambering over, quote, our few remains, unquote. I mean, it was somewhat surprised that really their few remains had created such a sensation and commented that the best measured drawings were done by Americans and that nowhere else were more Italianate gardens being done than, than in North America. The, um, for their own part, Americans were not altogether welcoming of this invasion of the Italian garden. Frank Wall, a landscape professor at the University of Massachusetts, was asked to contribute a chapter on modern American garden design to a German um, study of garden history, a very excellent book, still very relevant, called um, History of Garden Art by Marie Goethe. Frank, uh, Frank Wall wrote about this um, invasion of the Italian garden. He said that um, he saw a split between the gardens built by the, quote, parvenus, unquote, and those being done, quote, more cultured minds, unquote. And he mentioned specifically the new profession of landscape architecture, quote, a group of ambitious young men eager to learn all that Europe had to teach. And another aspect of the garden movement were, were the, from the horticulturalist end, uh, we have a, a book by a prolific writer of the period named, called the, oops, Yes, the American Flower Garden. It's not this one. Um, and written in 1909 by Nel Nelty Blanchon said, Our simple democratic society has no need of imitating the great gardens of Italy, where church and state vied with each other in the splendor of their open-air functions, or the excessively formal pleasure grounds of the French court to which Le Nôtre devoted his genius. But it is a mistake to assume that the formal garden may not serve our day and generation. So with apologies and reservations, uh, the US adopted the Italian garden. And here you see um, one of the many vehicles through which it entered. This is Phoebe Westcott Humphrey's 1913 practical book, practical book of gardening, garden architecture. And here you see what she considers practical in 1913. And here you see one from one of the illustrations, uh, one of the efforts, which was quite common to, to enter into this Roman, Italian Renaissance spirit. This is a house, nice uh, classic wood frame house that's added on a, a Roman style pergola. And here in Philadelphia, the Wanamakers uh, added on or created a tennis court also with a pergola. So the US have found many different ways of adapting Italian tradition, Renaissance or Roman to their needs. Um, before seeing some of these different adaptations, I would like to discuss for you, with you a bit how, how the Italian garden became, how it became so omniscient, so um, omnipresent in this country. And the um, Italians and Frank Waugh both mentioned travel. That was one way. Americans were going in increasing numbers to Europe. But uh, there's a limit, well, one limitation upon that was that unless you were J.P. Morgan, very well connected, or a single unmarried male from one of about six approved schools who had won a three-year Rome Prize, actually getting to see these gardens was no small feat. For instance, Caparola um, was a private house. In order to get into it, you'd have to get permission from Rome, then you'd have to take the train about an hour out of the city, then you'd be picked up by a horse taxi probably, and taken over the garden. Then there would be a custodian who would um, not believe you. Then you'd have to get up, you pa get past the the principal house, which is a great monument in itself, up past the 
down lower garden through the woods to the upper garden which is the water garden which is what is the the important the important part then when you finally got there you'd have these children of uh, the palazzo that now the president of Italy lives in in the summer were occupied by a peasant family and the children would uh, run around you begging for money and the garden was uh, in ruins pretty much so it was hard to get inspiration from a uh, such a trek as that and um, many this is, was the the problem and condition of the problem of of access and and the condition of many of the gardens in 1900 was deplorable. Edith Wharton um, wrote about one of the Edith Wharton being the author of Ethan Frome and the and the uh, author of an important book on Italian eight garden Italian gardens uh, said about the Villa Castello in Florence that it had lost all its charm. Uh, Charles Platt, designer of the University of Illinois campus, uh, Quad, and a, as we'll see, a very important figure in this movement, said about the villa, visited the Villa Deste in 1892, said that the um, the water source, all the water features were um, pretty bust, and that uh, the ref water in the reflecting pools was stagnant. So, no, travel was not the main source of inspiration. Um, there were other more convenient and more um, powerful sources. It, but it, I say the um, bursting out of the Italian garden in this country was a convergence of a number of events. Among these, a very crucial one was the rise of architectural photography. Photography was a fairly, I mean, good quality mass production ph photography was fairly new. I mean, a product of the 1870s, 1880s. And, uh, let's see. The, um, there was a great publishing splurge in the first 30 years of this century and on of architecture and the amount of pu uh, books concentrating on the Italian garden was uh, really very remarkable. The f it is significant that the first three books ever to be written in English, ever written in English on the Italian garden uh, were in the first seven years of the, um, this century and were all done by Americans. Um, Charles Platt, um, A.E. Forbes and Edith Wharton. Uh, these books helped set the stage, especially, and this is what differed them from um, European ones being done at the same time, especially that both Platt and Wharton's books were serialized in general interest magazines, um, Century and Harper. The first came out as serials in these magazines, which had, at least Century had a circulation of 200,000. So that was a very crucial way, and we'll see more uh, about this, that um, the Italian garden reached the United States. Another, I think, important factor was that um, the landscape profession started, was founded and got organized at the beginning of the century. Plus, uh, women, that was mostly men, but women were organizing too, and the Garden Club of America was founded in 1913. Then a final, very important, um, you can have the patrons, you can have the garden people, and you can have the, um, uh, the designers, but you've also got to have the laborers, and this was falling into place too. I've been influenced by a recent trip to Ellis Island, but the greatest period of immigration in this country was between 1880 and 1930, and the greatest single um, population to come during that period were the Italians very timely, and by 1929, five million Italians who weren't about, couldn't become uh, lawyers and politicians immediately and were happy to work in gardens. And uh, so there was, there was the labor force. And these, these gardens, as it's only too evident, very, will become more evident, we're only uh, 
very labor intensive. And if you had money, you could show it very easily by having an Italian garden. Um, returning to the point of photography being so important, the um, photo the books there were the American books were critical. They laid the stage, but they were not the books that architects later referred to. They did not have the illustrations. They did not have the quality and, and depth. Although um, Wharton's was a very fine study, the ones the ones they referred to were there were six six major books, um, mostly British, but two Germans, uh, one German and one, one, I mean, one French and one Italian. And on the right is a, a photograph from my, what I feel was the finest, H. Inigo Triggs. And this gives you an example of the quality of photography that influenced um, American designers. And most American designers would have at least two or three copies of these books in their library. Uh, Beatrice Ferrand, for instance, had four of the six books. And Beatrice Ferrand d designed the Harvard, uh, the Princeton and Yale campuses and Dumbarton Oaks. She was also Edith Wharton's niece. He, on the right, one of the types of Italian garden to come, Renaissance gardens to influence the US was the theater garden. On the right is a very uh, powerful image of the Villa Gori in Siena, and on the left is a 30s uh, air of that, the um, little theater garden in, in Raleigh, North Carolina. Uh, another important point, of, I, I actually would like to make, establish the um, a hypothesis, but I, I can only present it now as a hypothesis, that the Italian garden was probably the first architectural style to be promoted by photographs in, this, um, in, in the world that, that more than any other. Um, I mean, now we're all influenced by photographs of Michael Graves and, and Walt Dis doing Disney hotels, but um, then it was a fairly new phenomenon. And one of the things that uh, makes this a good, one of the facts that makes this a good argument is that these six books use the fourth, at least four of these six books use the same four photographers and even use some of the f same images over and over again. For instance, this, this um, photograph on the right is the Fountain of Lions from the Boboli Gardens in Rome appeared in, I think it was three of the books that the architects would own. And to show you, and so therefore it's not surprising when you see this image in Kansas City here in, um, this is on, in Hyde Park, in the Vanderbilt Estate, and other places. Um, again, another an important image. This is from Gromort, the French book. And another factor, it wasn't only photography, both Triggs and Gromort, who were architects, were also fabulous delineators. This is the frontispiece from the second edition of Gromort's book. And this is, was came out in 1931. This is a garden done in Santa Barbara, which incidentally is probably of any city in this um, country, the capital of the Italian Renaissance garden, full of Midwesterners and Easterners vacationing in the turn of the century. Um, this is Addison Meisner's house for the heir to Union Carbide, the Diedrich family, done during the Depression. And so probably, say, two or three years after this came out, and it's hard to not think that um, Diedrich and Meisner, the architect, was not influenced by this exquisite drawing, the frontispiece from that book. Uh, again, well, let's see. Another garden uh, with that same fountain, that same um, baluster treatment of the, of the fountain vase 
being set into the ballast, balustrade. Uh, this is in Oklahoma. This is also fairly late guard, 1920s, but so perhaps not influenced by that image, but, uh, but others because that was a favorite image in, in all these books. The, um, the, it's from the Bobley, the island of flowers at the Bobley Garden in Florence. This is the Phillips Place in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and now a, an art museum, Philbrook Art Museum. Um, a final influence on introducing the Italian garden into the United States were a whole series of world fairs that occurred between 19, well, 1893 with the Chicago World's Fair and 1915, which was the year of both the San Diego and the San Francisco um, Pan Pacific Exposition. Well, and then, then the Treasure Island Fair. Um, you've already seen how the garden in Woodminster took the fountain, installed the fountain afterwards. The Irwin Garden in Columbus actually has a feature from the St. Louis Fair of 1906. Oh, you've all probably one time or other heard about the importance of the Chicago Exposition and its great court of honor and the whole influence from Rome and, and classical garden tradition, the great colonnades and long vistas and water pools. Then um, the um, Pan Pacific Exposition in, in San Francisco, there's still the Palace of Fine Arts surviving from that, the Bernard Maybach um, reconstruction of a Roman ruin. I know, for instance, that um, A.E. Hansen, a landscape designer who did Harold Lloyd's house and many of the great places in um, L.A. of the 20s, Italianate, he decided to become a landscape architect after, in his teens, going up to San Francisco and attending the Pan Pacific Exposition. Um, so this, um, the world's fairs, again, like the Villa d'Este, you can't exactly reproduce it. You can't exactly reproduce this Chicago World's Fair in your backyard, nor can you easily install the Villa d'Este, but it can lead you in the direction of having an access with a bird bath. And in fact, this, according to Waugh, writing about modern American gardening in 1927, said this was the the, the common backyard. This was considered the modern landscape style. He said, um, a single simple axis suggested rather than defined and terminated by such an unpretentious figures as a bird bath or a garden bench gives the popular measure of formality. Um, a writer, uh, the Phoebe Westcott, the, well, the Phoebe, the one who wrote the book of practical gardening says, that um, because of cost-saving measures, mass production going on in this country, a man of, of very modest means may enjoy a duplicate of the Fountain of the Lions at the Vatican in his backyard. So, the uh, again, to reiterate, probably the most influential as far as creating a tradition of designers um, reproducing these gardens. The most influential um, source were the series of books, uh, 20 of them at least, between 1894 and 1931. But as far as setting the tone for the, the mass of the people, for the population to preparing them for the idea of the Italian garden, the world's fears. Now I'd like to just take you through some of, show you um, some of the really outstanding Italianate gardens in this country and some of the many ways uh, they were, it was, a, the tradition was adopted over here. Well, let's see. Um, something's out of place here. Okay. Uh, before, well, before I do that, there is another um, 
uh, garden that had a great influence on Americans. Um, not just, uh, you've seen a lot of water chains, but this is a um, the Villa Gambaria in Flor Florence, uh, a water, a sunken garden or a walled garden, of, of just a simple rectangular garden, but divided up into water components. And here is a 1906 interpretation of that on the Manchester, on the Massachusetts coast in the town of Manchester. Uh, that was the beach that um, Richard Henry Dana, the author of Two Years Before the Mast, uh, bought with his earnings. <laughs> and then it was sold to Gardner Lane, who then uh, commissioned the Olmsted Brothers to do an Italianate garden. Again, part of the Gardner Lane place. This is another version of uh, Rome. Is the tradition in Rome is is more uh, the hill garden with long axes and often water features, water chains. The tradition in Florence was more um, uh, just kind of a mall or a, a, an enclosed garden with one. <laughs> Water, the Rome gardens were more uh, active water features. The Florentine gardens were earlier, simpler, less um, dependent on hills and movement. This is the conservatory garden in New York, which um, really comes from that tradition more. This is um, East Fifth Avenue and about East 99th Street. And when I showed this in New York a few years ago, at the Architectural League, they all want to know where it was. It was only about 40 blocks away, and no one had been. Uh, it's a, another garden of the 30s, a, one of the great public gardens, and I think that was produced by this tradition. Again, uh, part of the New Deal um, heritage. Um, I, they're more accessible, so I probably have more of those, plus I've studied it more, but it doesn't mean that uh, there were more of those than teens and twenties. This is, in fact, um, this, I was going to say about, oh, this was um, designed by a Rome Prize winner. It's one of the few gardens I've seen that was di directly a, a benefit or a, a result of the Rome Prize, which was part of this whole movement, was that um, it was felt that it wasn't enough for Americans to stay here and study it. They had to go to Rome. And so well, this endowment was given for three uh, people. They were always trying to have three there. They never, or they didn't always succeed. But it was, the first one didn't graduate till the 20s. So you really don't see results until the 30s. And by then you're nearing the end of this movement. Again, another uh, walled or mall garden. I, I think when you were talking about when one talks about the Americanization of this tradition, one aspect is that it was popularized. It was made the the Americans did to the Italian garden, which had been the preserve of cardinals, popes, the Medici, uh, Pope Julius II. Americans made it uh, available in parks and. Um, it, to a scale down degree in backyards. It popularized the Italian garden. And this is another example of the 30s. This is the same architects who just hair and hair who designed the Dealey Plaza. This is, again, Dallas. This is Lake Cliff Park. Um, they had a big contract with Dallas. The Depression is a Kansas City firm that's still going. But one last point I wanted to make also about the Americanization of the Italian garden. You saw Gambaria. That's a, a kind of a. That's actually you're going to be really a stickler about Renaissance gardens. Not that Roman those waters, water basins, those water was added in the late 19th century in a renovation. But it, because the photographs in all in those six books were so good, um, and because Americans weren't particular about pure or 
investigate into a pure renaissance. That was very important. And I, I haven't shown you, unfortunately, I haven't shown you photos of what the Florentine gardens, which mostly aren't in great shape these days, were like. But this is more out of that tradition, as is the conservatory garden. And But Americans took a really, <laughs> at least the historical documentation or the remnants of these Florentine um, kind of turf gardens with the, an axis at the end was not great. There wasn't a great tradition, but Americans really built that up, and this has become a, a, a really a, an American um, sig signature mark of it's no longer even almost not Italianate it become, and m much of it was taken from one. American, early American interpretation, the Garden of Well, which was considered at the turn of the century one of the great gardens, was taught in all the schools, it was designed by Charles Platt, the same man who um, wrote the first book in English on the subject and designed the University of Illinois um, campus, the quadrangle. The, um, certainly this idea of a long dominant axis is very important runs through all the period. Here we see it at Mount Hood. This is the Frank Garden, now the um, College of Lewis and Clark, yeah, Oregon. And this is the Cleveland, um, art, one side of the Cleveland Art Museum and Olmsted. Warren Manning initially and then Olmsted Brothers. Very uh, fine 20s treatment of this concept of the long axis going down to a, a focal focal um, feature. The axis, the importance of the axis runs throughout. Here is um, Adler and Adler and um, Sher Sh Arthur Sh Shercliffe at Castle Hill, uh, Ipswich, Massachusetts, the Crane Place, the uh, Chicago um, foundry magnate. Here is, this was an influential garden, the Gillespie Garden by Bertram Goodhue in Santa Barbara, recently restored. And the alley um, was very much Americanized also. On the right, uh, a birch alley from the, um, uh, the place in Dayton that um, restored the house, the Sieberling, Sieberling place. And on the left, this is San Francisco, a 30s park, an entrance to a very ordinary uh, athletic park, but using the backs of the baseball bleachers as, an, as a frame for an alley. Um, Another alley, very simple. This is uh, a garden done by, again, Olmsted Brothers. It wouldn't have been Frederick Law Olmsted, either junior or, either senior or junior, but um, the principal designers was in the firm from the Hudson. And here, this is 14, this is Meridian Hill, 14 blocks north of the White House. Uh, now a, a ghetto area, but with one of the great of all time, um, uh, water gardens, a public monument that was in planning stage from 1914 to 1930-something. Architect. A lot of these places, the architects are a one-time name. Um, this is Meridian Hill on the left, and Fort Worth, the Rose Garden, uh, hair, hair and Hair again, I believe. Yes, it is Hair and Hair. And, but early... Uh, 1930, before they did Dealey Plaza. And Mr. Hare was, Herbert Hare was uh, very um, cognizant, knowledgeable with the gardens in Italy. He helped write one of the two guidebooks that were written during this period on how, to, for all the designers and, and travelers that were trying to go see them, that it was so difficult that that process necessitated the publishing of two guidebooks and well, two by Americans and one by British. That's a detail from Meridian Hill Park. Um, wonderful stone mosaic inlays in this colored concrete everywhere. Um, 
this is an interesting another cascade. This is from uh, Richmond, Virginia. Um, this is actually I, I don't may it's now a park, but it was a private um, estate. It's Maymount Park, and it uh, it shows you just how pervasive and powerful this imagery. It, of the Italian garden was because here you have this perfectly splendid rock with water running over it and which just seems like a natural for a garden for a for an ornamentation in your yard but they went to all the trouble of creating this kind of really quite uh, um, well anal almost water garden next to it I mean it's sort of tight and very uh, it's very self-conscious and particularly when you see it contrasted with that f fabulous rock. Another interesting feature of this particular garden is that there's a Japanese garden parallel to it, and this was also not unusual that some um, owner would install both a, um, Italian, an Italian and a Japanese at the same time, because there was a vogue, a sort of a minor in uh, vogue in Italian, Japanese. Uh, the Italian garden, as I said, went underground for a while. Well, it was quietly really being pursued by people who aren't considered, who are considered more modernist. But it's come out in full force in the last few years. Here it has erupted at the uh, Phoenix Hyatt in Arizona in the early 80s. This is a project by SWA and an architecture firm in San Francisco, the name of which is less important to me. And uh, this is really incorporating both French and Italian. Um, it's hard to be purist, and, and there's never been the, no one's really tried to be too much. But this is a very late 20th century interpretation of the Italian garden tradition. Here you have a viale, a alle, the vista, created with electric. Um, with lights and glass bricks. And here you have the kind of updated late 20th century uh, water consuming in another drought ridden state um, grotto. So uh, I think that's it. I just want to say that um, it is a great tradition, but there are some places where it's more appropriate than others. And uh, But I think you will constantly see it's and be, I hope be more aware of its, um, more, its great influence in this country. And make sure you do look at the, uh, the Ball Brothers, uh, the civic monument to the Ball Brothers, because it really is a very nice example in your own, one minute away. Thank you. <laughs>